any of us. If I do, if I allow myself to say whatever I think or feel whenever I do, it, it's going to hurt my self-esteem because it'll hurt my relationships. I'll regret what I say. If any, if any of us have ever said something, which we have, that we wish we could rewind and not do it. Welcome back to the Fascinating Woman Hit channel, where we talk about everything that has to do with femininity and building strong, long-lasting, loving relationships. I am Cherry Lynn, and I am here with my mom, Dixie Andal and Forsyth. Hi. Hi. So a while back, we did a video on character traits. They were all character traits that we felt women in general would like to focus on to improve overall in mm -hmm. their femininity journey. And we had some requests to go through those character traits and do videos on each one. I don't know, we might do a series and do all of them. I'm not really sure, but this is the first one that we're doing and it is on self-restraint. We get a ton of questions about this. Why do you think we get so many questions about self-restraint? Well, I think partly because as relationship leaders that a lot of us are, we often regret afterwards things we say or do and wish that we could do it a little differently. So we recognize the need to kind of be a little bit more control of our emotions in ourselves. What so. is self-restraint? Self-restraint is the ability to to deliberately choose when you will express allow yourself to actually it's kind of a luxury to express your emotions about something or someone in, in the appropriate way. We all want to do it appropriately. How many times have any of us said something and thought, oh no, I, I wish I hadn't said that. I wish you, could, you think about it later. I wish I'd done that differently. It's the ability to have a filter on our emotions as opposed to having no filter. Are you saying self-restraint is only on emotions and what we say? Does it have to do with anything else? It has to do with how we treat people and what we do. I mean, whether we, I don't know, use drugs or eat several plates of food or, I mean, self-restraint is in a lot of different areas. It isn't just what we say. It's how we react to things. It's included in my book because it's an absolutely essential quality in any long-term relationship to be able to deliberately control our feelings when they're not appropriate. Self-restraint is the ability to recognize quickly what you're doing, the ability to kind of temper a short fuse and realize, okay, I'm upset about this and it's not anybody else's fault and I'll just deal with it. And it's, and it's part of maturing. We all have to do it. Yes, and there's a certain level of sophistication that comes with this. You being able to master this and learn it, which by the way, it's a, this is a lifelong study. This is something you have to work on. I mean, look, look, I'm old and I still have to work on it all the time. And, all uh, do. Yeah. The reason we're talking about it is to keep us kind of on track. Yeah. And why is this very challenging for women? I know it's challenging for everyone, but what do you think women feel especially challenged with when it comes to self-restraint? It's one of our strengths and also one of our, our weaknesses too. Not a weaknesses, Achilles heels, we should say, because ah. we women are good at verbalizing. We also are not just good at it. We need to do it. It feels like we're getting a weight off our chest when we express something verbally. It feels good to do it. And a lot of the times it's perfectly appropriate, but sometimes it hurts people if we don't kind of control what we're doing. And we have to be self-aware at why we're doing it, what we're doing, and when we do it. Because sometimes we express ourselves and we think, oh my gosh, I totally dominated that conversation. And mm -hmm. we didn't want to. And that's why we tell ladies that sometimes if you need to vent, like we do, mm -hmm. tell your, be, be courteous and tell your husband, is it okay if I vent? That way he won't think he's done something and you're uh, attacking him. Because we can appear to attack someone when we're just getting it out and it feels so good to get it out. Our guys can just they have the easier ability Ability, not perfect, but that it's easier for them to either let it out in other ways or bottle it. That's true. You've talked so many times about how men have this tendency to disappear, go into the man cave, put up a wall. They they actually are practicing some self-restraint there. And now it's not always necessarily the best option when it comes to your relationship, but there is a touch of that there that is probably very healthy because they are keeping themselves, and I don't know about you know, this isn't the same for everyone, but they might be keeping themselves from a big explosion. They well, don't. sometimes men do explode or they explode yeah. 
other ways. They'll get maybe get more physical where we get really verbal. Right. Have another Achilles heel. And sometimes they, the thing about men is their Achilles heel is that it's harder for them to verbalize accurately their feelings. Right. And they may have heart problems if they right. bottle things too much. Thinking of a, the big picture, what am, I, what am I wanting in my marriage? It's not just today, the fact that I, I'm going to use the, the weight gain thing. And then I got on the scale and I gained a pound or two. And, and you know very well that these things happen. Your, your body weight doesn't stay identical every day. It still bugs you. And any, lots of things bug us. The weather bugs us. The politics bug us. All kinds of things bug us. How are we going to live our lives and live our lives deliberately so we say, I'm not going to let this thing control my life and yeah. my relationships with my family and my loved ones. Now that we've kind of touched a little bit on what it means to have self-restraint, what it means to you and why you were so inspired to put it in your book, we want to talk a little bit more uh, specifically about everyday self-restraint and kind of dive deeper into what that looks like on a daily basis. And some we want to go through some tips as to how to go through these three categories that we have and how to just improve upon it and try to be more aware of times when you could maybe exercise a little bit more self-restraint. So the three categories, and some are going to be obviously much easier than others. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. The first one is physical. Things like our mannerisms, the way we sit, our facial expressions and our body language. To me, those are a lot easier to be aware of and, and change because they're just things that we can do. And they're not attached to deep emotion. That's the other thing. And they're more like habits. So um, what do you mean by what do you mean by the way we sit in our facial expression? How can you so, what do you <laughs> Well, if you've ever I mean it might be us, easy for you, but it might not be easy for everyone. Well, you have to become more <laughs> self aware like the like the woman who habitually sits with legs wide apart like a man. What do you, and you know these things, you may have learned these habits over a period of time and not even been aware of it. Then you're suddenly aware of it. And oh my gosh, you see yourself in a picture or a video and you think that, that is not the image I want to portray. Yeah. Mannerisms like burping. I mean, some people actually do burp loudly in public and don't think anything of it. Or you, the way you greet people, slapping men on the back. <laughs> when you <laughs> no, it sounds kind of extreme, but some women have manner, and I'm using extreme ones to make the point, not that we all do that, but uh, gulping, I mean, just physical mannerisms. The way There's a movie with Doris Day called Calamity Jane. It's a really great movie. When you're talking about restraint when it comes to physical things like mannerisms, I think about her in that movie and how she tried so hard to be kind of like one of the boys that she literally started talking like a boy, sitting like a boy, dressing like a boy to the point where Doris Day, one of the most feminine actresses I can think of, people would mistake her on the street for a man. If you don't get out of here this instant, Mr. Canary or Mr. Calamity or whatever your name is, Mr. Why ain't no Mr. You're, you're a woman? Why, of course I'm a woman. You thought I was a man? <laughs> <laughs> and to me, one of the things that's great about that movie is in spite of her being a good actress, she's a great actress, she couldn't quite be convincingly that masculine because she really was deep down a very feminine woman. Right. And in the end of the movie, she does end up going more towards a feminine direction and kind of keeps a little bit of her tomboyish part. <laughs> I think that to me, if anybody out there needs a visual, hopefully that can kind of give you an idea of what we're talking about. But the second category, which more of us fall into that is social, which means verbal outbursts, uh, sharing unwelcome opinions, gossip would fit into that too. The things we say and do on social media. Yes. And I think also a big part of this category is how you converse with your man. Don't just stand there, find the scoops. Find the scoops, cut the rope, roll the boat, get out of bed, go to sleep. I'm sorry I ever came on this darn old trip. That makes two of us. Well, that's the thanks I get for coming along to help you. Help me? I would have gotten more help from a drunken 
kangaroo. Whoa! Dive! If yes. you have outbursts with your man and you're having arguments or maybe you're just complaining. And, and it ties into what we already talked about, about giving yourself the luxury of just saying what you want, when you want, without thinking of the other person or the consequences. You just had to get it out. We'll show a scene from Forever Darling. You can see in this scene how she just lets everything out on him. And just, you know, scene I'm talking about where she says, complains about everything all at once and she just explodes. And that's good. And he's like, what? <laughs> yeah, and he just, and then he yeah. explodes back and they both explode on each other. So that's well, good. you're no prize. You have a few faults of your own, if you must know. Oh, I have, have I? Yes, you have, have you? Maybe I annoy you, but let me tell you something. You annoy me too. He's spilling ashes all over the place. If I didn't trail around after you picking up lighted cigarettes, you'd burn holes in every piece of furniture in the house. And this thing. Oh, 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 it drives me crazy. You'll never learn to play it properly. It's a perfectly ridiculous hobby. Oh, I don't agree. Albert Einstein played the fiddle. Well, you're no Einstein. And you snore. Well, I'll let you in on a little secret. So do you. I do not. <laughs> and you, you suck your teeth all the time. Mm -hmm. And you talk with your mouth full. You don't know how those things can get on a person's nerves. Sometimes I think I'll scream. Go ahead and scream. I will not. And the same thing goes with social media. People type things that they many times would not ever tell the person if they were face to face. The third category is emotional. And that includes uh, self-discipline, stress, uh, downstairs, basically all downstairs feelings, including things like our periods, the way we tend to act mm -hmm. on our periods. Mm -hmm. When you're talking about emotional restraint, are you talking about, you, you said a few things. Uh, is this just basically all feelings then? Not so much how you feel, but what you do with your feelings. Because feelings, we have them. And women have lots of them all the time. It's what we do with them that makes the difference here and can build or damage our relationships. And we regret it. Most of us are good people that regret, oh, I shouldn't have said that. I can't believe I did that. And then we do it over and over and over. I think, too, with emotional restraint, I think this also has a great deal to do with discipline. So many women say to us, you know, well, that's just not me. You know, or I, you know, I wear my heart on my sleeve. I've heard that so many times and I'm proud of it. You know, you, I've heard you say this so many times. Well, how you are is you were also not born toilet train. You have to learn those things. And being disciplined is something that you have to learn and self-restraint restraint and discipline go very hand in hand. Because if you just live your life on every impulse that you have and every pleasure that you want to have, then you're constantly going to be fighting yourself in staying in the basement, as you say in your book. Well, it also hurts your self-esteem. Any of us, if I do, if I allow myself to say whatever I think or feel whenever I do, it, it's going to hurt my self-esteem because it'll hurt my relationships. I'll regret what I say. If any, if any of us have ever said something, which we have, that we wish we could rewind and not do it. We don't really want to hurt people. We're not really trying to, and we don't want people to think that we're a bad person or that we're weird or or we just don't have any uh, class or anything like that. So to, for someone to say it's just the way I am, it's not true. We have There's so much more to us than any of us really usually even realize. And what we're trying to do in, in Fascinating Woman is to help us get closer to that. Nobody's going to be perfect, and that's yeah. absolutely fine. But to be closer to it, we'll have better self-esteem, better relationships. Everything is better. And I think, too, especially when you're talking about homemakers or stay-at-home moms or both, I think this is a tough one because when you are at home, let's say you're, you have kids that you're caring for, it can be difficult to say, almost manage yourself and manage your time and your emotions. It requires you to develop an amount of restraint and say, this is what I will put up with. This is what I will allow in my home. This is what I will allow for myself. Mm -hmm. It takes a great deal of restraint to be able to a great deal of courage to be able to exercise that restraint. And I think to me, a lot of our audience that falls into the category of homemaker and stay at home mom, they do struggle with this a bit because 
you know, you've heard the ladies say, oh, I'm, you know, I'm not motivated at home. Or, you, you know, we recently had that one where the woman was saying how she feels like she's buried in chores all day and she feels kind of like a slave to her chores. Well, a lot of these things can help you if you can practice some of the restraint. Yeah, and I, I've got to say that quickly with Gone with the Wind, Duke Scarlet a little bit of a disservice because she often said, I'll think about that tomorrow. I can't let him go. I can't. There must be some way to bring him back. Oh, I can't think about it now. I'll go crazy if I do. I'll think about it tomorrow. When something was too stressful, I won't think about that today. I'll think about that tomorrow. I'll go crazy today if I do. Mm -hmm. That is a, a way of coping that she often used that would help her because she went through some pretty tough things. Yeah, yeah so this is a great example because it shows so many different hills and valleys of all, a, a lot of the women, but particularly the two leading ladies in it. The two lead and if it won't pain you too much, India will. I'd be much obliged if you'll tell me why you're staring at me. Has my face gone green or something? It won't pain me. What happened this afternoon was just what you deserved. And if there was any justice, you'd have gotten worse. Oh, India, hush up. Oh, let her talk, Melanie. She's always hated me. Ever since I took your brother Charles away from her, though she's too much of a hypocrite to admit it. Why, if she thought anybody'd take after her, she'd walk down the street naked. I do hate you. Ladies in it. The two leading How ladies. they demonstrate self-restraint in different ways. I'm so glad to see you. Melanie Hamilton, what a surprise to run into you here. I hope you're going to stay with us a few days at least. I hope I shall stay longer than that for us to become real friends, Scarlett. I do so want us to be. We'll keep her here, won't we, Scarlett? Oh, we'll just have to make a bigger fuss over her, won't we, Ashley? And if there's anybody who knows how to give a girl a good time, it's Ashley. Though I expect our good time seems terribly silly to you because you're so serious. Oh, Scarlett, you have so much life. I've always admired you so. I wish I could be more like you. You mustn't flatter me, Melanie, and say things you don't mean. Uh, and diff all three of these categories, really, yeah. Um, yeah. struggling with it. What advice do you have to practice self-restraint in general, talking about everyday challenges mm -hmm. for these categories? Well, number one, set small, realistic goals. A lot of times they'll say, I'm going to go to the gym every day for an hour a day, and I'm going to do this from now on, and then we can't do it, and then we feel terrible. So yes. set small, set, I say that because I've done that. Okay, so yeah. set small, realistic goals for yourself that you can do. Like if, you, if you're in the habit, let's take something more physical. If you're in the habit of uh, sitting with your legs wide apart and having these bad manners, you can say, today I'm going to see what it's like to not do that. And at the end of the day, evaluate how you felt. But it can be things like, I'm not going to wear pizza clothes today. I'm going to wear, I'm going to dress nicely and do something with my hair and I'm going to, I can do that today. I can, mm -hmm. you don't say I'll, I'll do it every day for the rest of my life. Well, I do that, but I've, I've always <laughs> done it. So <laughs> I've always done it. Like so I don't long. Know. Yeah. You can start a project and say, I wanted to make this recipe. I'm going to do it today. You can do small things. You can decide the next time you're annoyed, if you're constantly annoyed with your husband, you can think about it in advance and think today, if I'm annoyed with him, I'm going to first think about what I'm annoyed with for then. And, you know, Bob likes to use the example, and he, he's seen it with patients. Some, and these are extreme, where they'll say, I can't help myself. I just had to belt that person. Uh -huh. Oh, fix that with makeup. <laughs> I mean, as I said, it was extreme. Bob will say to them, if you did that and a policeman walked by, suddenly you would, you would control yourself. You actually do have control. If you're used to saying sarcastic things to your husband, if you were in a group of people, you would control yourself. You probably wouldn't do that in front of, in certain circumstances. So that just shows we all can control it if the circumstances are right, but we can set our own circumstances and deliberately yeah. do it. I think too, with setting small goals, you can also set boundaries with yourself and say, I will not engage in online arguments. I just won't do it. And make a commitment to yourself and say, that counts as a small goal. Saying, I will not engage with them anymore. It's just not on the table. 
I, I agree because online, social media, it, it's appalling what people will say to each other online. Even people in the same family, they'll engage in these online discussions. And it, I think it's like if you go to the mall and have a really loud with bullhorn arguments with your family, nobody would do that. But they do it on social media, forgetting that it's like doing it out in a big public place where everybody can hear. Everybody's yeah, media is almost like a brave mask that you put on. It's like you log in and all of a sudden you're wearing this brave mask and you feel brave to say all these hateful things to people you either know or strangers or both. And it's a form of self-restraint that I think is just becoming lost. People are well, just not... To me, it's like maybe none of you've had this, but the age old idea that, that sometime in our childhood, we had some dream that we went to school and we discovered we were only in our underwear. And we thought, yeah. oh no, I, that, that total, you, you wake up and realize I'm completely exposed. I'm in public. Yeah. That's what you're actually doing on social media. When you do that, you're exposing yourself and you're not even aware of it. Yeah. It's like you got on the bus, school bus, and you forgot to put your clothes on and you're sitting there and suddenly everybody can see you. That, it, that's what you actually are doing. And so the restraint would be to, if someone says something that's really triggers you, scroll by real quick. <laughs> Just scroll by. You don't have to say anything. And, and to keep the relationship then later, look for times when they post something you agree with and hit like or say something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that takes a great deal of practice, but that's a big one. Yeah. So that's number one is setting small, realistic goals. You can do that. And over time you get really good at any of these. Number two, we've said this recently, we've said it before and we'll probably say it again sometime, but replacing a bad behavior with a good one. We're going to keep saying it because it's so important because it isn't enough to just say, stop it, just stop it. In order to stop it, you really need to replace it with something else. It's mm -hmm. much harder to just go like cold turkey, just mm -hmm. stop something rather than replace it. For, for example, say you, you often get triggered when your husband does a certain thing, plan in advance when, if he does that, if he, uh, I don't know, what might he do? Leave his shoes out. And, and always in the same place, you always trip over him. Plan instead to, the response to that would be different. For me, I would say, put the shoes away. Don't say anything. Mm -hmm. Make it a gift for him. If you don't, if, if your response always ends up in something unpleasant, mm -hmm. plan what you're going to do differently. It's much easier to do. You think, ah, here it is. It's happening. And so you plan to do it. And so you do it. Much easier. Absolutely. And I think you're, you're not only shifting your response, you're shifting your mindset, which right. I know sounds not very believable, but it's so true. You really are shifting your mindset. It's just like the power of positivity and how it really does change it you. It really is. It's, it's a, changes your mind. Or it's your, a paradigm yeah. shift. Instead of, there is not one way to look at something, even in uh, politics there's not just one way to look at something there's i've heard some people say that no matter how something turns out politically there's a bright side that could happen on either way you can look at well if this happens and i don't like it what good could possibly come of it there's always something it's a paradigm shift that can happen and number three is try to do upstairs things and in fascinating womanhood timeless we talk a lot about being in the upstairs of your mind, which is in the more positive, creative, actually better self-esteem part of your mind, doing upstairs things as much as possible will make it easier for you to not have outbursts and to do all those things. And that includes self-care, that includes exercise. And if you're struggling and stressful, I know you and I do this, we'll put on something that makes us feel good, either music or like I Love Lucy or a Dora Stay movie. And it helps us to be more centered. Those are things you can do to stay upstairs in your rational mind, your creative mind. That's upstairs stuff. Whereas the basement thinking is more, what if stress, everything's horrible. I've got to think of something real downstairs to deal with it, like eating an entire pizza, <laughs> you know, those kinds of things to deal with stress. There's drugs, alcohol, food, sex, all those things to deal with stress. Whereas upstairs, helps you to deal with it in a way that you don't have regret. Absolutely. What is, what are some things that you do on a daily basis to keep you? Cause I think this is something we would suggest you do every day. It's almost like a, it's a, it's a proactive approach towards demonstrating more self-restraint. So For me, I'm a very emotional person. I am kind of high strung. I'm not ridiculously high strung, but I'm kind of high strung. 
And so for me, I always make my bed. I always get dressed up because that helps me set up my day. So I'm some, somewhat organized. I also recognize when I'm extra stressed out and I'll put on music that helps me or I'll put on a show on TV. I have a TV in my kitchen that I can put on something that is it's a distraction mm-hmm. that helps me get away from that. Oh my gosh, what if this happens? Or I'm worried about this thing or this person. And mm-hmm. it helps, it kind of changes the subject and helps me get more centered. I do something for someone else. I find that when I'm helping somebody else or thinking about somebody else, I'm not as worried about my own problems. I yeah, I think there's hundreds of things you could do. You just yeah. have to find what works for you. But even if it's something small, because I know a lot of our audience are, are moms and they struggle with this. It's like it, this falls into the self-care category for a lot of ladies. And I loved we recently interviewed Lily, um, our my niece and my granddaughter. Yeah. yeah. And she said, I I loved this in the video, in the interview that we did with her. She said, if she's struggling with self-care, she knows she can always make herself a cup of hot cocoa and just sit there and drink it. And it it brings her to a place of peace. And I think that's great. You just have to find what that is for you. For me, it's exercise. I have to have exercise to feel like I can stay upstairs. So finding that for you and being proactive enough to say, well, what is it that will help me to stay upstairs is going to help you to practice that better self-restraint in any of these categories. It also helps you to have someone to talk to that you can feel like you can talk to. A lot of women, honestly, and it's not a bad idea, they want to talk to their husband because it's the one they trust the most. But sometimes husbands, sometimes it frustrates them if we need to go on and on. We've talked about this before. And we need to, when we express ourselves, we need to express it until it's all out. We may go over the same subject for a half an hour. Yeah. <laughs> and it's too much. It's too much. So, we'll get that. Yeah. so, so Bob will do this and get out. And then I think, oh, great. Oh, whoops. I've gone <laughs> too far. Up. Yeah, time's up. Yeah. And so somebody that is supportive of you, yeah. that's not going to go and tell everybody what you said to them. Someone who's supportive to you to talk or write in a journal. And I like your suggestion of exercise. And there's, so many things you can do, but those of us who are mothers, have little kids, you're always serving them. When you serve them with your heart instead of, okay, I got to do this and I have to do that. But when you're actually thinking of them and trying to help them and noticing what they say and enjoy the cute things they say, you're, you can stay upstairs with that. I hope everyone out there that has difficulty with the full bottle, as I think some therapists say, we're not saying that you should bottle everything. <laughs> I hope that this no. doesn't come across that you should bottle everything for self-restraint reasons. This is a way no. of saying, I don't want to fill my bottle. <laughs> try not to fill it and try to release some of it so that you don't explode. Because I know a lot of people that say, well, you know, like I just need to explode. My bottle's full and my, my stress bottle. And I think, you know, we're not suggesting that you just put a lid on it. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that because when you explode, it means you bottle things for a certain period of time and then it explodes instead of like my mother used to talk about like a teapot that gently bubbles. And instead of it exploding, you want to deal with things as they come up when it were never possible. Right. Instead Instead of bottling, 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 exploding. And I know that's a very common technique. I don't know if that's the right word with therapy is they'll say, you know, someone has anxiety or stress and they'll say, well, you have a bottle that's filling, you know, you heard about, you heard about that. Yeah. And I think we are similar on the similar lines of that. And and what we're talking about, we're just diving deeper into what it looks like, but I don't want anyone to think that we're suggesting that you bottle everything because that's not healthy either. Well, not only that, we're not that good at it. And it, <laughs> isn't, it, isn't, it isn't healthy. It doesn't work very well. So yeah. instead, it's better to, if you can, say, what is going on? What am I feeling? And right. honestly identify what I'm feeling. And then if you can you say, well, that's ridiculous. I, I feel this way. I felt this way yesterday. It, it bothers me when I get, a, oh, I'm just going to use something random. I get a lot of annoyance phone calls. And I get, mm-hmm. I can get irritated with, okay, what can I do about that? I can turn the darn phone off once in a while. Oh, really? I, I don't have to answer them. So mm-hmm. in other words, those are little things. If you can recognize it and deal with it and remember that identify feelings, which are things like hungry, tired, afraid, mad, sad. Those are feelings. Not I feel like so-and-so should have done this. That's not really a feeling. 
It's a right. thought. It's a thought. So identify feelings, and then you think, is it reasonable that I feel this way, or I'm just going to let that go? Right. I'm just hungry. I'm just tired. And just, I'm not really upset with this person or that person, or that person hurt my feelings. Like I'm saying I'm angry with them, but actually they hurt me. Yeah. And, and if you deal with that, that's easier than dealing with this person made me angry because they said I was incompetent or whatever. Instead of saying that, they hurt me. Right. So it actually resolves it better than to try and cover it with anger. Yeah. Well, this has been really valuable. I hope everyone loved it out there. And if you haven't read Dixie's book, I know we get a lot of ladies that watch our videos and love our content. And then they miss this part of the end where we talk about Dixie's book. So you should definitely check out the links below if you haven't read her book already. She also has workbooks that go along with her books. Just definitely check those out before you sign off. And we're here every week. So don't forget to check back with us. If you have any questions for us, we would love to hear from you. If there's anything we left out, we'll love to hear from you about that as well. We will see you next time. See you next time. Bye.